Hello. My name's Douglas Kell. I'm a professor at the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom. My main subject is really systems biology, which is a way of understanding complex biological systems. For quite some time now, I've been doing collaborative projects with my colleague, Professor Risha Pretorius, who will now introduce herself. Good morning, I'm Risha Pretorius. I'm from the University of Stellenbosch from the Physiological Sciences Department. And as Doug mentioned, we've been doing collaborative work for some time now. So if we look at the first slide, it shows a series of biological processes that we think explain quite a lot, if not all, of chronic inflammatory diseases, of which there are many, including Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, atherosclerosis, type 2 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and so on. And much as was found out in the study of ulcers, which were not thought to have a microbial origin, but do in fact do so, we've come to recognize that many of these chronic inflammatory diseases also have a microbial origin. But if they were normally a microbial disease, such as an infectious disease, where the microbes were replicating, uh, we would know all about that because you'd be very dead very quickly. But the microbes are not replicating, they're actually dormant. And that means that they don't replicate, even though on a good day they could, they're not dead. Evolution in nature has selected for microbes not to uh, stop replicating and die when they run out of goodies, but to continue to uh, survive and wait for a good day to come. And we recognize that dormant bacteria are actually quite prevalent in humans and that a combination of iron dysregulation, which is how Risha and I came to work together for a shared interest in that subject, iron dysregulation allows these dormant bugs to wake up. They then shed a nasty thing from their cell wall called lipopolysaccharide or LPS and that creates a lot of inflammation, which is, say, is necessarily the hallmark of these chronic inflammatory diseases. What we more recently found, and we'll see some pictures shortly, is that they also have some dramatic effects on the clotting of human blood. And these coagulopathies, so-called, are actually a major part of these chronic inflammatory diseases, which lead to the formation of something called amyloid, and that itself is toxic and leads to cell death. And these are the kinds of manifestations of these chronic inflammatory diseases, whichever place they're in, different disease, different microbes, different places, but the basic story is the same as on that slide. And while we were doing these studies, uh, Risha started pointing out to me that uh, we could find bacteria lurking in the blood samples that we were studying by microscopy. And of course, if they were replicating bacteria, you'd be in dead trouble, uh, but they're not. They're dormant. And this led us to recognize all of what I've just said before. And in fact, 20 years ago, I'd worked on dormant bacteria in the form of a clade called actinobacteria, which TB is the best known. And everybody knows that TB can lie dormant for many years. So now, armed with this recognition that the microbes were present, we then proceeded to a series of other studies. And that's what Sarisha is going to tell you about now. So as Doug mentioned, um, during all inflammatory conditions, uh, you will find that um, the coagulation profiles of the individuals that are suffering from these conditions uh, are changed. And we can measure that with various um, techniques. And one of the uh, techniques that we used in a recent paper that was published was by looking at how these fibrin fibers of the clot in a hypercoagulable states during inflammation would look like um, in a healthy individual and then how would a clot look like in an individual with some kind of inflammatory condition. So the slide that is on the uh, screens right now represents a healthy individual's blood clot and we added a marker that fluoresces under a super resolution microscope that we call an airy scan super resolution confocal microscope. So this microscope 
microscope, if you add a fluorescent marker, it will light up certain things if the fluorescent marker binds to it. So Douglas mentioned the term amylogenic protein. So in a healthy individual, you would suspect that the clot would form fine fibers with open spaces so it would look like a, a, a bowl of spaghetti. Um, if you add a marker that will bind to um, aberrant morphology or aberrant structure in a clot, you would find it, it fluoresces um, intensely. So if you look at this specific slide, you would note that there are just a few little fluorescent areas inside a healthy clot. And the fine little nets that you see it in the background, not really visible, that, are, that will be the fibers of the clot. Now, if we move to the next slide, in the current paper, we actually looked at type 2 diabetes. Now, we know that type 2 diabetes individuals are hypercoagulable. They have got an extreme inflammatory profile. Now, due to all of these inflammatory molecules, and then particularly um, looking at uh, individuals with um, uh, with, with LPS, as, as Doug mentioned, you would find that a pr the product is, that is the inflammagen is the LPS. Now in this slide, we added LPS to, a, to the same uh, blood as the previous uh, slide showed. So it's a healthy individual where we added LPS to. So as you can see on this slide, the LPS has actually damaged the, the clot structure fundamentally, where the marker, the, the fluorogenic marker, binds to these areas that is damaged. And what we believe, and we discussed in the current paper, is that these open areas um, where the, the marker binds to is actually nothing else but this amyloidogenic protein that has formed. So then we looked at the diabetes. So um, A and C, you can see a typical diabetic individuals, blood coagulation, clot profile. So if you compare that to the previous slide where we actually took a healthy individual and added LPs to it, it doesn't look that much different. So in the current um, paper, we decided to try something else. We decided to see if there might be a product or a compound that may reverse the actions of this um, clot structure that we, we noted. So we added the LPS binding protein. And this binding protein is always in an individual. We make it. It's present in, a, in any individual. However, um, due to the fact that there are so much um, inflammation and LPS in a um, inflammatory um, profile of an individual, uh, it probably doesn't do its work properly. So we added LPS binding protein to this uh, uh, diabetic individuals, and we found that we could actually reverse the damage that was seen in their clots. So uh, if we move to the next slide, uh, what actually happens to the fibrin fibers? If you note at the top there uh, is a typical protein structure of a healthy individual's fibrin fiber structure. If you go down with the arrow towards a more pathological damaged uh, structure, you will find that the alpha helix of the protein changes to a more plate-like structure, um, which is then the pathologic morphology. And this is what we think is happening in diabetes in particular, but all inflammatory conditions. So in the next slide, um, just to, to recap, the LPS is from the bacteria wall, specifically the gram-negative bacteria that you can see associated with red blood cells in this specific uh, diagram. So if we look closely at another um, type of um, morphology where we can uh, zoom in and use another type of technology, the scanning electron microscope, 
at, on the first, at the top A a slide, you will see once again a healthy clot structure. Now this structure of the clot is viewed using a scanning electron microscope. So a scanning electron microscope is like a normal microscope, however it can magnify whatever you see up to a million times. So it's a very, very nice um, type of instrument to look at actual fibre and structure. So, if you look to, at the bottom at B, you will see how a typical um, uh, clot will look like from a diabetic individual. So you'll see these plate-like structures uh, and formation of the, of the, of the clot. Um, and in the previous slide that I mentioned from an alpha helix, and it goes to uh, this beta sheet structure, um, is actually shown on um, this slide at the bottom. So if we zoom in, into the next slide, here is an example, A, B, and C is how typical uh, diabetic individual clots will look like. And next to it is the exact same individual where we added the LPs binding protein. So this is a confirmation that the lipid binding um, protein actually is able to reverse the morphology from a pathological structure, plate-like um, clotting, hypercoagulable clot to looking like a healthy individual's um, clot. So uh, what we discovered then is that we do believe that in diabetes, the LPS binding protein can actually reverse the aberrant or pathological clot formation. And secondly, that we can see that um, it can be changed uh, by looking at different technologies, scanning electron microscope um, technology, as well as super resolution confocal uh, microscopy. So finally, to conclude again with the overall systems biology picture that we saw at the beginning, that was set out as a kind of hypothesis as to what we thought was going on, and Rich has illustrated the fact that we now have a considerable amount of evidence, much of it new, for, to the effect that that is precisely what is going on. And so with that, we conclude what we have to say about our new paper, which we think is a very exciting potential advance in the diagnosis and treatment of type 2 diabetes. <laughs>